Welcome back to The Emily Show. It's been a very busy week in and out of court. I'm glad you're here. Today we are just talking about what's going down in Georgia in the Young Thug YSL RICO case that has been on pause. We talked about this case a few weeks back when there were motions coming out to not only recuse the judge to deal with one of the attorneys being held in contempt and ordered to serve 20 days in jail over the weekends while the trial was ongoing. And that's been going up through the appellate court process. And then we finally saw the transcripts from that ex parte in the judge's chambers hearing and more. Lots to talk about today because there's finally an order removing the Judge Glanville from this case. So we're going to talk about that. A few quick Baldwin updates and then what's going on over on YouTube the rest of the week. So are you guys ready? Yes, I'm ready. We should just get into it. Welcome to The Emily Show. I'm Emily D. Baker, the Internet's go-to legal analyst and big fan of the cursey words. I've been a licensed attorney for over 17 years. I'm a former prosecutor, and I break down the legal side of pop culture and entertainment stories we can't stop talking about. We should just get into it. Let's go. A huge thank you to today's sponsor, Green Chef. Are you ready to get that farmer's market fresh food delivered right to your door and take the stress out of making meals? Because, well, your Green Chef meals come with all the ingredients you need to make a meal and really easy to follow instructions that include pictures, which I love. So you're bringing those summer farmer's market vibes home with pre-portioned and prepped quality whole foods and chef designed recipes. You can choose from over 80 different menu items each week. Our family relies on Green Chef, and especially when I'm in trial, I will add in things like a breakfast charcuterie board or an easy-to-make breakfast or lunch. So if you're ready to find out for yourself why Green Chef is the number one meal kit for eating well, now is the time. Go to greenchef.com slash emilybaker50 and use code emilybaker50 to get 50% off plus 20% off your next two months. That's greenchef.com slash emilybaker50. 50 and use promo code Emily Baker 50 to get 50% off plus 20% off your next two months. Let's get back to today's episode. So today, as I told you on Monday's Quick Bits episode, I was anticipating going over the motions regarding Hannah Gutierrez Reed. Those have not been filed yet. Yes, Attorney Bowles went on all of the news media and said, I will be filing this ASAP, anticipate Monday. Things happen. Law is law. I'm not surprised. But that's what I was anticipating we would be talking about. Yes, I will be answering more questions about the Baldwin trial, about the dismissal, about Hannah Gutierrez-Reed and the civil cases as we go forward. But I wanted to wait for the motions from Bowles before we do that. So if you want my whole breakdown on really the key takeaways from Friday's dismissal of the Alec Baldwin case, that is on the Quick Bits episode that dropped Monday on this audio feed and then on YouTube that's on the Quick Bits channel. So it is on a separate YouTube channel than my regular live streaming channel, but it's over there and, of course, on the audio feeds. So with all of that, there is not much more really to say, I don't think, with Baldwin. There's going to be more to come out in this week and the weeks to come, and I'll be keeping an eye on it. And, of course, those civil cases are still moving along. With the Karen Reed case, there's quite a lot going on in court, and a hearing is happening on July 22nd. I'm breaking that down on live stream. So, of course, if you have the Law Nerd app, you will know when I stream, breaking down everything going on with the jurors who have come forward to say they actually reached verdicts, but then didn't put them on the verdict form and what's going to happen from there. That will all be with you in the chat on the live stream, because I know there's going to be so many questions that it just needs to be a live stream. So make sure that you have the Law Nerd app so you're notified of all the live streams, which are normally on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 11 a.m. Central when I'm not in trial. But today we're going to look at this 10-page motion recusing Judge Glanville off of the Young Thug trial. Remember, this trial is still on pause, like a really angry housewife at this point, on pause. We don't know what's going to happen next. Yes, this is going to be reassigned to another judge, but there's some quirks to having another judge come in mid-trial on a case. So will this case still be a mistrial because of everything that happened with the judge? And will that allow for the case to be retried? And is that even what anybody wants? Remember, it took them almost a year to pick a jury. 
a year, almost a year, 11 months to pick a jury on this case. And they started trial in December of 2023. So does anybody want that? Well, yes, the defense is asking for it as a remedy. So the defense has been asking for, but not really mistrials, dismissals with prejudice. They want the Baldwin result in this case so that it can't be retried. So let's get into this order and break it down. Again, I'm gonna go through all 10 pages with you if you're listening in the audio. I will let you know if I summarize anything or skip ahead because some of the background information we know and I've covered, some of the background information is really helpful detail as a reminder of how this played out time-wise in this extensive case. And I am recording this on July 15th. This order came down in the morning of July 15th out of Georgia. This is, of course, commonly referred to as the Young Thug case. It is the YSL Rico case, and we're going to get into all of that. There were numerous motions here. So this is an order on the motions, multiple motions, to recuse Judge Glanville. The three motions before the court are Defendant Kendrick's motion to recuse the judge that was filed on June 12th, Bumpus's motion to quash the order to show cause and or recuse the judge, Kyla Bumpus is the stand-in attorney for the witness who was in that ex parte hearing that we're going to talk about. And then defendant Jeffrey Williams' motion to disqualify or recuse Judge Glanville from all further dealings in the above referenced case and amended supplement. The order goes on to say the specific facts necessary to determine the recusal motions are well documented in affidavits, court filings, certified transcripts, and video recordings available on YouTube. T tell me it's a streamed case without telling me it's a streamed case. When we finally see a judge acknowledging, hey, we can actually watch back what happened. So just the transcripts don't always give you the tone, don't always give you the vibe for what went down in court, but watching it on YouTube absolutely does. And I appreciate starting to see court saying, look, this is very well documented and you can in fact catch the replay on what happened. Courts should have streams. Having considered the record evidence and applicable case law, the court finds as follows. Findings of fact, the recusal motions arise out of a multi-defendant prosecution brought by the Fulton County District Attorney's Office alleging gang activity and associated crimes. This is the RICO prosecution all centered around YSL uh, music label and whether or not it is being used as a ongoing criminal street gang falling under the racketeering laws, which I broke down six plus plus months ago. Although there were 28 defendants named in the indictment, only six were being tried as of June 7th, 2024 with a footnote to one of the defendants, Adams's case was severed. And though he is not currently on trial, his case was transferred to this course because Kyla Bumpus's motion to recuse the judge in association with the show cause and contempt issue was filed in Mr. Adams' portion of the docket. So Adams was the seventh defendant. That case was severed. That defendant's not on trial. The motions to recuse all arise from the same circumstances related to the state's witness, Kenneth Copeland. On June 7th, the state intended to call Kenneth Copeland to testify, footnote three, see transcript, which we've talked about. If we need to read the transcript in full, let me know in the comments and we'll read the transcript in full. Prior to his testimony, counsel for Copeland, Jonathan Melnick, appeared and indicated in open court, keep in mind, in open court, appeared and indicated in open court that Mr. Copeland did not wish to testify and intended to invoke his Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination. Judge Glanville brought Copeland into court and discussed with him the effect of an immunity order that the judge had entered that granted immunity to Copeland. Judge Glanville specifically advised Copeland that if he invoked the Fifth Amendment and refused to testify, the state would ask for Copeland to be held in contempt and jailed. Judge Glanville also advised that, if asked, Glanville would jail Mr. Copeland for refusing to testify. Remember, the Fifth Amendment is your right against self-incrimination. You can't be forced to testify against your own self-interest. But if you've been granted immunity and you're not going to be prosecuted, there is no 
penal interest there. You can't be prosecuted. So there is nothing to protect from. So you can be forced to testify. And if you refuse to testify, you can be held in contempt and jailed. We talked about this a lot in the Baldwin case with Hannah Gutierrez. Would she come in and testify? Would she not come in and testify? Would she come in and try to plead the fifth? And then what are they going to do to her? She's serving 18 months in custody. What are they going to hold her in custody till the end of the Baldwin case, which at that time would have lasted maybe another seven days? Yeah, okay. Do you think Do you think she's like, oh, no, I don't want to do that? I mean, she's serving it at the same time as the rest of the time they've given her. So often you will still see people, particularly if they are in custody, serving a time on other things, refuse to testify and be like, go ahead. I'm already in custody. It's when people are out of custody and then going into custody that this becomes um, – more persuasive. The order then goes on to say, after that discussion, Mr. Copeland spoke to his attorney and then indicated he would testify. Once called, Copeland was asked to specify his age and instead of answering, stated, I plead the fifth. We can see how this went. The judge excused the jury and then advised Copeland in open court. This judge has done a very good job of noting when this took place in open court. Advised Copeland in open court that he was in contempt and ordered him jailed until Monday, June 10th, at which time the judge told Copeland they would revisit Copeland's willingness to testify. His attorney spoke to Copeland and then reiterated to the court that Copeland still intended to invoke his Fifth Amendment right if called as a witness. The judge indicated that he would revisit the issue with Copeland on Monday, June 10th at 8.30, and court was adjourned for the day. On June 10th at approximately 9.10 a.m., Judge Glanville met with counsel for the state, Adrian Love, and standing counsel for Mr. Copeland, Kyla Bumpus. Footnote four. Two investigators from the DA's office and multiple deputies were also present, as well as one or more members of Judge Glanville's staff, including his court reporter who took down the conference. The certified transcript was filed into the record on July 1st. So that is the footnote indicating that it wasn't just defense counsel for Copeland, the DA, and the judge. There were also DA office investigator, deputies, court staff, and the court reporter. That is a large meeting in chambers. And I imagine it felt kind of cramped. I don't know how big these chambers are, but that's a lot of people in chambers. It goes on to say the meeting took place in Judge Glanville's chambers. Counsel for the trial defendants did not participate in the meeting and were not aware that the meeting was taking place. Remember, these are the judges finding a fact in the order. The Attorneys for the defendants on trial did not know, were not aware, did not participate. The transcript reflects that Ms. Love, the DA, told Judge Glanville that she wanted the meeting to both impress upon Copeland the risks of refusing to testify and allow Copeland to ask questions before he testified. Love also expressed concerns to the judge about Copeland's representation. Ms. Bumpus, Ms. Love, and the judge also discussed the scope and effect of the state's grant of immunity to Copeland. Again? This should, this should, this should have been in open court. The order then goes on to say Mr. Copeland was then brought to Judge Glanville's chambers where he spoke with and asked questions of his attorney Bumpus, the judge, and Simone Halton. I think that's how you pronounce her last name, counsel for the state who had joined the meeting. So another DA joined while this was all going on. It says during that time, the state advised the witness Copeland, that he would remain in custody until the conclusion of the trials of all the defendants in this case, not just the six on trial, all 28. This case took 11 months to pick a jury and is expected to be in trial, well, before all this happened, until 2025. So when the DA is saying, we will keep you in custody till the end of all of the trials. We're talking well beyond 2025. The judge discussed the rules with Copeland and his rights and responsibilities after a grant of immunity. Copeland spoke privately with his counsel and then advised the court that he would testify. After the meeting and immediately before Copeland was brought out to testify, defendant Williams' lawyer, Brian Steele, advised the court that he was aware of the in-chambers meeting that morning. Steele objected to the ex parte meeting, and a lengthy colloquy occurred between Steele and Judge Glanville, in which Judge Glanville inquired how Mr. Steele became aware of the in-chambers meeting. 
Mr. Steele declined to reveal the source of information. Yeah, he said repeatedly that it was not attorney-client privilege, but it was work product. Like, this is part of my work of defending my client. I can't disclose that to you. So Mr. Steele's ethical obligations and the judges, name them, tell me who told you, became a showdown in court, which again, well documented because of the YouTubes. Steele declined to reveal the source of the information. The judge held him in contempt. This judge holds people in contempt. Just done. No, we're going to set a meeting for later. No, we're going to set a hearing. No, just like I'm finding you in contempt. Immediately done. It's wild to watch. It then goes on to say Judge Glanville held him in contempt, though Steele was allowed to remain in the courtroom on behalf of his client, Defendant Williams. Ultimately, Copeland did testify on June 10th and was later released from custody. The next day, the judge issued a show cause order requiring everyone present at the ex parte to appear and show cause as to why they should not be held in contempt for disclosing information about the ex parte meeting to the defense counsel. So the judge issued an order demanding everyone that was at that meeting in chambers to go on the record and say why they should not also be held in contempt for disclosing the nature of the meeting. The meeting about the thing that was put on the record in open court on Friday, right? And this is after Brian Steele had an attorney appear in court on his behalf and say to the judge, your honor, you're holding him in direct contempt. You need, there's due process rights here and you need to follow this due process. And the judge is like, no, I'm sentencing him to 20 days. And she's like, there's due process here. And the judge goes, if you don't tell me how he knows, I'll hold you in contempt. So it was just ev ev everybody's going to be held in contempt was what was happening during this period of time. So held the defense attorney in contempt, threatened to hold the defense attorney's attorney in contempt, then threatened to hold the attorneys who were in the in chambers in contempt for telling Brian Steele. Yeah, right? An amended show cause order was entered setting July 1st for an in-camera review of the transcript of the ex parte meeting. The first motion to recuse followed, filed by DeMonte Kendrick on June 12th, 2024, footnote five. Technically, Mr. Steele's counsel moved to recuse Judge Glanville from further handling of the contempt action during the June 10th proceedings because he shouldn't handle the contempt action. But that's an aside from me. However, that motion was made orally and it is not before the court at this time because Mr. Steele's contempt matter is currently pending before the Supreme Court. Fun little footnote. It's not sassy, but it's informative. Kendrick's motion seeks to recuse Judge Glanville for his involvement in the alleged improper and coercive ex-party meeting with the state. On June 14th, the judge denied the motion, Judge Glanville. Judge Glanville determined the recusal motion was timely supported by an affidavit and on cursory review contains assertions of fact that support the allegations of bias and partiality. However, Judge Glanville ultimately determined that because, quote, there was no way to verify the veracity of the information contained in the affidavit and there was, quote, no actual evidence of the extent of the discussion during the in-chambers meeting, the affidavit was legally insufficient and the motion to recuse did not require referral to another judge for consideration. Narrator. But the motion does require referral to another judge for consideration. Always. Like, always. Always. What? The motion doesn't require forwarding to another judge. It has to go to another judge. What? I don't know how these attorneys kept their composure. I really don't. On June 14th, attorney Kyla Bumpus filed a motion to quash the show cause order and or recuse the judge. Remember, the judge was like, you're going to come tell me why I don't hold you in contempt too. So it was a motion to quash the order to show cause or recuse the judge from presiding over any contempt action against Bumpus resulting from the alleged disclosure of the ex-party meeting footnote six. Although referred to this court for consideration, Bumpus's motion to recuse is both premature and moot. Because Ms. Bumpus has not yet been held in contempt and because on July 1st, Judge Glanville canceled the show cause hearing. I'm not surprised the judge canceled the show cause hearing. So 
it's odd that you'll see something both too early and moot, but it's too early because there's no contempt and it's moot because the show cause regarding contempt is off calendar. So it is moot. That is why it is moo. It is moo. On June 17th, Jeffrey Williams filed his motion to recuse the judge. And this, this is probably the only sass we get in this order, but it says divorced from its hyperbole. Williams's motion to supplement also seeks to recuse judge Glanville because of his involvement in the ex parte meeting, which Williams also alleges was improper and coercive. That's Steele's client, Young Thug. So Steele's motion was, well, there was a fair bit of hyperbole. I covered that on the podcast. Steele's motion had all of the smoke, like all of it for this judge. But his attorney also speaks that way in court. Like his attorney very much writes the way that he stands in court and argues any of these motions. And there has been a lot of back and forth between attorney Steele and this judge over the course of this case, just since evidence has been underway. I have no idea what happened during jury selection, but just since evidence has been underway, there's been quite a lot of back and forth between them. But it's pretty funny that this judge is like, divorced from its hyperbole. <laughs> The motion boils down to the fact that he wants the judge recused because of the involvement in the ex parte hearing. It goes on to say Williams's motion alleges both actual bias and the appearance of bias because the judge allegedly participated in the accusatory process when he met with Copeland and the judge became, quote, embroiled in a controversy when he held Williams's lawyer, Steele, in contempt. On July 1st, the day appointed for the parties to review a redacted transcript of the ex parte, the judge announced that he was releasing the entirety of the transcript of the ex parte meeting and was taking, quote, judicial notice of and making a record regarding certain matters associated with the ex parte meeting. This part is going to become particularly relevant to the judge determining these motions to recuse. Most of what the judge relayed was a coalition of record evidence about the recent circumstances in the case. The judge also explained how he became aware of the state's request for an ex parte meeting. In addressing the circumstances of contempt against Mr. Steele, the judge explained the court's purpose and concern in pursuing information about the security and confidentiality of his chambers. Judge advised that he had not instigated an investigation into surveillance footage, but had reviewed such footage for timeline and security. The judge then explained his view that the ex parte meeting was proper under Georgia law and outlined relevant law that supported his inherent authority to hold such a meeting. The judge maintained that no one gained a tactical advantage as a result of the ex parte nature of the meeting. The judge also questioned defendant's right to be present at the ex parte meeting because the issue under discussion was between the state and a witness who was represented by counsel. After making this record, the judge announced that the show cause hearing was canceled and that the recusal motions filed by Kendrick Williams and Bumpus were being referred for consideration by another judge in accordance with the Uniform Superior Court Rule 25.1 through 25.7. As it should have been at the beginning. The motions to recuse were then assigned to this court for consideration. So that is the outline of facts as this judge finds them to be. So that is the judge saying, this is what happened. And now you need to take what happened factually against the legal framework to come to a decision. Sometimes you just need to try something new. And with today's sponsor, Thrive, I am rocking a much bolder lip than I would ever normally try because their new Empower Matte Lip Crayon makes it easy. This is one of the reasons I love working with Thrive is everything in their cosmetics line is vegan and cruelty free. And they have the Thrive Giving Promise where they give back a portion of each purchase to their giving partners, but they also make it simple. And the Empower Matte Precision Lipstick Crayon is really just that. When I talk about wanting all of my makeup to be crayons, this is exactly what I mean. So this two-in-one lipstick and liner allows you to do everything, line, define, and fill in just a few swipes. And it's waterproof and sweatproof and lasts for up to 12 hours. So you're not going to outwork this lip. 
that is working. Right now, you can get an exclusive 10% off your first order at thrivecosmetics.com slash Lawnard. That's Thrive Cosmetics, C-A-U-S-E-M-E-T-I-C-S dot com slash Lawnard for 10% off your first order. Let's get back to today's episode. Legal Framework. Motions to recuse are governed by a specific legal framework outlined in Rule 25 of the Uniform Rules of Superior Court. A party seeking recusal must file a timely motion supported by an affidavit, clearly stating the facts and reasons for the belief that bias or prejudice exists. The affidavit must be definite and specific and describe, quote, circumstances of extrajudicial conduct or statements which demonstrate either bias in favor of any adverse party or prejudice towards the moving party in particular, or a systematic pattern of prejudicial conduct toward persons similarly situated to the moving party, which would influence the judge and impede or prevent impartiality in the action. And we saw all of that lined out in Brian Steele's motion. We saw him going through what he argued the judge had done that show that there were statements, that there was bias, that there was prejudice, et cetera. And then the other two things, the affidavit and timely filing. The rule goes on to say that bare conclusions and opinions are not, quote, legally sufficient to support the motion or warrant further proceedings. Once such motion is filed, it is the duty of the assigned judge to, quote, temporarily cease to act upon the merits of the matter and assess the timeliness and legal sufficiency of the affidavit and alleged fact. If all three criteria are met, the motion's timely, supported by affidavits, and the facts alleged might warrant recusal, another judge shall be assigned to hear the motion to recuse. Shall. Shall. Not may. Not might. Shall. Shall means fucking do it. Lawn or dictionary. Shall means must fucking do it. It's not discretionary when it is a shall. When it is a shall, you shall. <laughs> you must. Another judge must be assigned. And he was like, nah. <sighs> okay. Another judge shall be assigned to hear the motion to recuse. And also, not only does the law say must, but it also just makes common sense. Like they're asking you to recuse yourself. If the motion meets all the criteria, someone else needs to hear it. Someone else needs to mitigate that. It goes on to say in this order, when considering a motion to recuse, the assigned judge should be guided by rule 2.11 of the revised code of judicial conduct, which provides that, quote, judges shall disqualify themselves in any proceeding in which their impartiality might reasonably be questioned, shall. Not that their impartiality is lost, but that someone else could question it. Can you be reasonably impartial when it's about you and your behavior? And then it cites the case that that comes from. It says the standard is objective, from the perspective of a reasonable, fair-minded, and impartial person, rather than the affected judge or other interested party. You, y'all, the law nerds. Reasonable, fair-minded, impartial. Does it pass the sniff test that the judge who's being told that they are biased or prejudiced against a party and should be taken off a case, can they be impartial when determining if they are in fact biased against a party. If there has been a pattern of behavior that indicates that they are biased against a party or biased for a party or prejudiced against a party, can that individual reasonably detach themselves from it to evaluate it? So the law says shall in two places, and this judge has pointed out the two different places where the law says you must yeet thyself and give this to another judge. The judicial conduct code and the law. Two places it tells you to yeet thyself. If a motion to recuse satisfies the three threshold criteria, the assigned judge must 
refer the motion for reassignment and may not oppose the motion. So just in case anyone was confused about shall, which no one is, just in case anyone was confused about shall, the case law also says, if you have the three basic thresholds, affidavit, timely, facts, not just conjecture, then you have to reassign it, have to, must, and you may not oppose the motion. It goes on to cite case law saying, the judge whose recusal is sought may not respond to the motion or attempt to refute the allegation which stand denied automatically. No matter how false or even defamatory, the judge might know or perceive the allegations to be. It's pretty strong language for the case law. You cannot defend it. A judge cannot become actively involved in presenting evidence or argument against a motion seeking his recusal without that defense itself becoming a basis for recusal. And guess what happens here? Further citing case law, it says a judge has no interest in sitting on a particular case at most. His interest lies in protecting his own reputation. A big reputation. Big reputation. Sometimes. The case law is like, right, because humans... It goes on to say his efforts at defending himself against a motion to recuse will inevitably create an appearance of partiality. One reason is that if he defends himself, he becomes an adversary of the movement for recusal. So if the judge is defending himself against, in this case, a defense attorney, now you've become adversarial to the defense attorney. And now that you are adversarial to the defense attorney, it is ground for you to be recused because you have made yourself an adversary to them, not the referee anymore. This adversarial posture may create an antithopy which persists after the motion to recuse is denied. So it creates that adversarialness that could extend beyond the motion to recuse because now you've made yourself an adversary to one of the parties, which you cannot do. You are not adversarial or shouldn't be. And guess which direction the judge goes with this? That. That direction. So we're going to get there. Analysis and discussion after laying forth all of that case law, which is very clear, must yeet, cannot defend analysis and discussion. Here, Judge Glanville had previously announced on the record that the motions were timely and supported by an affidavit. In transferring the cases to another judge for consideration, Judge Glanville necessarily determined that the third criteria was satisfied, i.e., that recusal might be authorized if the facts alleged in the motion were assumed true. Therefore, Judge Glanville was required to refer the motion for reassignment and was prohibited from opposing the motion. Judges do this, right? This judge has picked the path of least resistance. You see this in judicial rulings literally all of the time. The low-hanging fruit is what gets picked on judicial orders. It's not taking the most difficult issues head on. Oftentimes, it is finding the easiest path to the result and sticking with that path. And this judge has done exactly that. Judge Glanville was required to refer the motion for reassignment and couldn't oppose the motion. So then we're going to get into what Judge Glanville did after the ex parte hearing while addressing the ex parte hearing, but not really addressing the ex parte hearing. Keeping in mind that this judge is the site judge and the presiding judge, so the boss judge of all of these judges. It is worth noting that this court agrees generally with Judge Glanville's assessment of the propriety of the ex parte meeting. While the meeting could have, and perhaps should have, you perhaps, perhaps should have, ma'am, and perhaps should have taken place in open court, nothing about the fact of the meeting or the substance discussed was inherently improper. Okay, judge. However, in his order denying defendant Kendrick's motion and in the process of making his record on July 1st, Judge Glanville added facts, provided context, questioned the veracity of the allegations, and otherwise explained his decisions and actions and argued why those actions were proper. So he defended himself. So the judge is tackling this on the grounds that the motions for recusal the handling of the motions for recusal are the issue, not the ex parte hearing. Addressing the more narrow question, 
that has very clear case law. The propriety of the ex parte is going to get a bit muddier, right? You're allowed to meet for scheduling issues if witnesses feel unsafe. And so you get into a very muddy determination about that ex parte. Does it sit wrong with me? Absolutely it does. Can I understand why the defense attorneys are so mad? Absolutely I can. But instead of getting into the muddier waters, the case law on this area is super clear. So the judge has put to the side the ex parte and gone directly with the behavior after the ex parte on those motions for recusal. Because, well, the case law is clear and the behavior is clearly outside of what is required. The order goes on to say, while it may be appropriate for the judge to disclose information relevant to his potential recusal, such a disclosure must be made in a way that is as objective, dispassionate, and non-argumentative as possible so that the judge is not reasonably perceived as a hostile witness or advocate. Remember, when we say hostile witness in the context of law, we're not talking about an attitude of hostility or vibes. We're talking about adverse party. So a hostile witness is a witness adverse to you. So it is a witness called by the other side. So when we're talking hostile, just think adverse. They can also be very hostile attitude wise, right? But that's not what that means specifically. So when witnesses get mad, I always see the question on stream, like as a witness is getting feisty, it's like, is this a hostile witness? It's like, no, they're not. They, I mean, they're acting with hostility, but they already are an opposed witness or a witness adverse. So when somebody's getting cross-examined, they're already adverse. So when you see those motions to like, mostly on television, because in real life court, they generally call them different things. You wouldn't say, Your Honor, permission to treat this witness as hostile. You see that on TV, but in most jurisdictions, you have case law that would be cited. And that means you can cross-examine the witness even if you called the witness. You can treat them as adverse, as if the other side called them. So I find that it's always helpful to remind that the word hostile in this context does not mean what it colloquially means, which is why law is always so confusing. <laughs> it's like, that word does not mean what you think it means in this context. Yes, yes, I know that's what that word means, but law. <laughs> Back to the order. It says, in presenting his record as to the recusal issues and in ruling on Kendrick's motion, Judge Glanville evaluated and accepted the truth of his own factual allegations, his own, mandating his recusal. So the way he handled the recusals mandates he be recused. This court has no doubt that Judge Glanville can and would continue presiding fairly over this matter if the recusal motions were denied. But the, quote, necessity of preserving the public's confidence in the judicial system weighs in favor of excusing Judge Glanville from further handling of this case. And there are footnotes eight and nine on that, which both cite back to case law. So this judge is making a finding that the judge could continue. So this judge is saying very clearly they are not making a finding that Judge Glanville is biased against a party or prejudiced against a party. They are saying only that the way the judge handled the recusal motion is the improper way to handle the recusal motion, and that fact warrants the recusal. So when we're talking about judicial sidestepping, this tackles the issue and recuses the judge without calling out the judge. It just says you shall not defend and you shall transfer it to another judge and you failed to do those two things. And because you failed to do those two things, you have to be recused. This judge is saying, I'm not making any comment on whether you were presiding fairly, not presiding fairly, whether the ex parte was a problem. In fact, this motion says the ex parte probably should have been on the record, but I'm not finding that there was anything wrong or improper with it. It was just the handling. So the result is the recusal, but it is a very narrowly tailored order that I'm sure the defense attorneys will be using to try to further get the case dismissed. But it doesn't say that the judge acted improper in a way that would require the case to get dismissed. It doesn't really give a lot of leeway for anything more. It just gets this case assigned to a new judge. But we'll see. This came down today as I'm recording this, so we'll see what the defense attorneys do from here. I imagine we'll see a bunch of new motions. 
when the jury will come back in this case, who knows, but they are still off until this case gets up and running. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. We're going to finish this order. Based on the foregoing, the court hereby orders the following. On defendant Kendrick's motion to recuse the judge, that's granted. On Bumpus's motion to quash, it is denied as moot. On Jeffrey Williams' motion to disqualify and recuse the judge, granted. And then the clerk of court shall reassign this case, shall in all caps, using the court's case assignment procedures, which are normally some randomized procedures to make sure that the case is reassigned to another available judge. So what happens from here? Well, the case is going to be reassigned to another judge. But again, this case went through 11 months of jury selection and has been in trial since November. I don't even know how many days of trial it's on because there's been starts and stops and issues, but we're months and months, at least, what, nine months into trial. And at the end of the prosecution's case, the defense attorneys are all going to make motions to throw out the case. How does a new judge get caught up to speed on eight, nine months of trial? That is months of reading transcripts. And how can a new judge get caught up to speed on all of the water under the bridge? In this case, in a way that they can preside over this case going forward, in a way that's fair to all six defendants. And how can they do that in a way that still preserves the integrity of the jury that took 11 months to pick? You expect a jury to not come across any information about this case if you have to break for another three months to get caught up or four or more, that no one's going to get sick, that no one's going to have uh, issues with work, that no one's going to have now upcoming vacations, holidays, and the rest of it. I don't know how you do that to a jury. I don't know how you do that as a judge to really, truly get caught up to speed. So I think now that the judge has been recused off the case and a new judge has been assigned, it will be interesting to see if this lands in a mistrial. Though, after this much trial, it's really hard to also look at a mistrial when it took almost a year to pick a jury. I don't know how a judge moves forward from here. I really don't. It will be interesting to see. I will be watching it. I'm sure the defense is going to continue to advocate for a dismissal with prejudice. We've seen those motions already. And at a minimum, a mistrial. But it is quite a lot of work that this judge is facing to get up to speed on this trial. They can't just say, okay, well, you've been in trial since late November, early December 2023. I've been assigned. We're going to resume on Monday. They have to catch up with everything that's gone before in the case, everything that's gone before in the case. And that is a substantial undertaking <sighs> with a sworn jury. I don't know where we go from here, but there's going to be a lot more motions. I'm very interested to see what happens with the contempt with Brian Steele. Seeing Judge Glanville literally say, you're in contempt and you're in contempt and I'll find you in contempt to everyone that walks in the courtroom was wild to me because it's just been so different from my experiences in court with judges who will warn numerous times of contempt and then, if anything, set a hearing. Finding contempt on the fly, on the record, without a hearing and issuing jail time is absolutely wild. And the amount of time it happened in this case was, uh, was quite something to watch. But again, a reason that transparency in our courts so that people can watch is needed. And the Young Thug case, you can't really have an audience go sit in and watch because the size restrictions of the courtroom. There are six defendants at this point in the case with all of their teams of lawyers. There's no room for the public to come in and watch. So having it streamed does keep a public eye on a case that would be practically very difficult for the public to come in and watch. And we've seen that with other large cases, too, where the court has said this needs to be publicly available in a digital way because the community can't all attend. The community can't all be present. And I think we're going to see that more and more. I wonder how many courts are going to start treating it the way that Idaho did, where Idaho said, we're going to take over 
all the feeds. We're going to put them up on our YouTube channel, and that's exactly all that we're doing. We're going to feed it out from our courthouse. Nothing else. No media cameras in court. No risk of a juror being shown on court because the cameras are fixed and set up. No risk of one media over the other media getting this. Nothing. The court just does it themselves. Our court's going to just kind of turn into C-SPAN. I don't know. But we're at a time where we're going to start to find out, and cases like this and the others that we've watched are good examples of why eyes on cases and the public eyes on cases are needed. And we're always going to keep learning more about our court system because there's constantly cases where I'm like, what just happened? If you haven't watched my stream from last Friday with Alec Baldwin, go watch the shift from the morning to the evening. It's so dramatic. Emily in the morning. Yeah, the defense is throwing everything at the wall to see what sticks. They got really unfavorable rulings yesterday and they were on the back foot. Midday, Emily. I'm sorry, what the fuck is happening here? This judge might dismiss this case. What? End of day, Emily, what is happening? What am I watching? What is going on? Oh, she's dismissing this case. Wait, why is the prosecutor on the stand? It was a complete roller coaster. The chat described it multiple times as a space mountain type roller coaster of a day, and it was. But this is why we need to see what's happening in courts. Because if you just saw the headline and didn't see the entire hearing, the reaction is, what just happened? Did this happen because he's an actor? Is this just Alec Baldwin getting away with this or this or that? You have no grounded facts for everything that happened without really seeing that entire hearing. And I'm really thankful that we get to do that together and that your support of not just like the sponsors on the podcast and me and being members on the channel and now in the app, that all of that help support what we're doing here as really an independent source. I don't have to talk to a newsroom about what I cover. I get to talk to you. I get to break down the cases as I see them. And that includes from the beginning of the day going, I don't think this is going anywhere to the end of the day going, this is the only option. This is the only result. It's wild. And I appreciate being able to do it. And I hope that it helps you understand what's going on in our courts better the way the laws interplay, even when we don't agree with the way they play out, where they can change. We most recently really saw that in Utah. And how all these things work together to understand where our system is working, even when the result doesn't feel like the right result. In Baldwin, it's hard. It's the right result, but it's hard. Here, this was easier for me. This is absolutely the right result. It doesn't feel hard. It feels like the absolute right result. And there will always be results that are legally proper that don't feel quite right. And the more we talk about them, I think the more we understand them. And maybe, just maybe, sometimes those things will also change. A huge thank you to today's sponsor, Shopify, who not only hosts the Law Nerd Shop, but you'd be surprised at how many of the shops you love operate with Shopify. There's times I'm shopping online and I'll get the pop-up for Shopify pay. And I'm like, oh, another Shopify shop. I see you. And even though I know that Shopify powers like 10% of all e-commerce in the US, I'm still always delighted to see brands that I shop and love also powered by Shopify. And that's because Shopify is a global e-commerce platform that helps you grow no matter what stage of business you're in. Whether you're just taking your first orders or moving past a million orders, Shopify is there with their award-winning customer service to help you every step of the way. And you don't only have to sell your goods on Shopify. With Shopify Collective, you can curate products for your customers too. And Shopify helps turn browsers to buyers with a checkout that converts 36% better than other online platforms. You know why? Because it's easy. So if you are ready to find out how your business can grow with Shopify, now is a great time. Sign up for a $1 per month trial at shopify.com slash lawnard. Remember, that's all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash lawnard to grow your business now. And you're going to start hearing this sound soon. Let's get back to today's episode. So hang in there. It's been some wild weeks in court and out. But you're here. And I thank you for being here. So thank you for being here. Thank you for being a lawnard. Thank you for all your support your humor, and for the ability to parse the facts from the fuckery 
even when it's hard, even when waiting for answers is uncomfortable. Because as Tom Petty says, the waiting is the hardest part. So with all of that, say it with me. May your Wi-Fi be strong. May your toilet paper be plentiful. May your family be well. And may the odds be ever in your favor. Lonard, I will see you in the next one. Hopefully on live stream like tomorrow. So we'll see you then. You can stay up to date with everything I'm covering on our free iOS and Android app at lawnerdapp.com or search your app store for Lawnerd. And you can also follow me on social media at the Emily D. Baker. Remember, I stream on YouTube on Tuesdays and Thursdays. I recap all of that for you in quick bits on Monday. And of course, The Emily Show drops on Wednesdays. Thanks for being a Lawnerd.